And now, the moment that we've all come here for, let's first receive the moderator for this afternoon. I understand it's the Reverend Mark Thompson, host of Make It Plain from Sirius XM. Yes, and now, the color girls in this order. Miss Donna Brazil is a veteran political strategist and adjunct professor at Georgetown University, author, television, political commentator, former interim chair of the Democratic Party. Miss Yolanda Caraway is the founder of the Caraway Group a woman and minority-owned communications and public affairs consultant firm with offices in Washington, D.C. For over 30 years, the firm has significantly impacted the Democratic Party's goals and objectives. The Reverend Leah D. Daughtry holds the distinction of being the only person to serve as the chief executive officer of two, I said two, Democratic National Conventions, with responsibility for planning and executing all aspects of the 2008, 2016 conventions. She is the executive minister of the House of the Lord Churches, and along with her sister, represents the fifth generation of ministers. Miss Mignon Moore is considered one of the nation's top strategic thinkers with extensive experience in political and corporate affairs as well as public policy. Former CEO of the Democratic National Committee, she also served as assistant to the president and director of political affairs during the Clinton administration. Put your hands together for the colored girls. Come on, let's celebrate them, Brooklyn. Let's celebrate them, Brooklyn. Let's celebrate them, Brooklyn. Let's celebrate the colored girls. Let them feel Brooklyn love. Nobody does it like Brooklyn. Come on, where Brooklyn at? 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 Yes, where Brooklyn at? Where Brooklyn at? Yes, come on, clap one more time for these beautiful women. They make us proud, they make us walk taller, put our shoulders back. All right, Reverend Mark, it's on you. Enjoy the conversation. Give an honor and glory to God. Praise the Lord, saints. How's everybody doing tonight? Um, let me just begin this way because I know where I am. I want to give honor to the shepherd of this house, um, the Reverend Herbert Daughtry. And let, let's just say, uh, Leah's home. But in a sense, we all are home because um, without this place, a lot of the movements we've had in the past 50 years would not have come to fruition. This was a very necessary stop on all of our freedom struggles, dealing with police. But this was Black Lives Matter here before there was ever Black Lives Matter. The, the free South Africa movement, all of that. So just once more, let's give a, a thanks and honor to the shepherd of this house, the Reverend Bishop Herbert Daughtry. Now, now, I was going to say, you didn't have to do that. I know what I'm, she got home <laughs> to the first lady because we know this just doesn't happen by itself. And he knew that. He missed the march on Washington to stay by her side while she was giving birth to this child right here. And that's why they've stayed together as long as they have. Every person I was married to 
when, now hear me now. Don't laugh at me, Tony. Every person I was married to, when I organized and attended the 20th anniversary march, the 30th, the 40th, and the 50th, and the Million Man March, I ain't married to no more. So that goes to show you, when you stay home and don't go to them marches, you stay married. Let's hear it for the first lady of this house. Amen. <laughs> I'm a living example, amen. Um, glad everybody is here tonight and hopefully we'll have, I know we'll have, we'll have a very meaningful uh, conversation uh, because these are four women in history. And let me also just say that um, the fact of the matter is that if we were living at a different time, I think, um, when we talk about great African sheroes and generals and warriors and queens even, Tai, Hatshepsut, and Zynga, years from now, I think they're gonna refer to these four in the same way, don't you? Because in their context, they have been our leaders, queens, and generals, as a matter of fact. Uh, and they all came up witnessing history, each and every one of them. Yolanda, how are you? Good to see you. Um, Rochester, New York. And it describes in the book, early in life, you were influenced by an incident of police violence in, in Rochester, weren't you? Yes. Tell us about that, if you would. Well, there was an, inc there was an incident um, back when I was a teenager, uh, and a young man got killed, and we had riots. And we'd never experienced anything like that. Rochester was a predominantly white city. Um, and my brother-in-law at the time was the head of the NAACP. He was also a minister. So he was always very involved. So I kind of tagged, I was a kid, I was like 10 or 11, and I always tagged along with him to all of the things. And that's really kind of how I grew up and got into the movement was following him, my, my, my brother-in-law, who was like 15 and 20 years older than me. Yeah. We've been dealing with this police violence thing for a long time. Leah, right here in Brooklyn, there were at least four incidents in your childhood. And that spurned what was not yet called Black Lives Matter, but the movement right here out of this church, which also gave birth to another four that influenced you, the big four. Tell everybody about what was going on here and who the big four were and how they influenced you. Sure, yes, uh, thank you, Mark. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to the house. Um, you know, I grew up here in Brooklyn, and, and, and when I was a young child, there were a string of police killings. Clifford Glover, in fact, his sister is a member here. Where's Darlene? Uh, she's downstairs. She's, she's a servant leader, and so she's, she loves to serve. But Clifford Glover, Claude Reese, Randolph Evans, and of course, Arthur Miller. Uh, one right after the other uh, were victims of uh, police abuse of power. Um, and so there were, the community here decided that how many of these were there going to be? So it was particularly around the, the killing of Randolph Evans on Thanksgiving Eve 1976. Uh, he was killed by a police officer, Robert Torsney, that four men came together, my dad, Assemblyman Al Van, uh, 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 Professor Sam Penn, whose wife is here, his widow is here. Where is she? Where is she? C. Doris Penn um, Amen. Is, is here. Um, and Baba Jitu Wiyusi from Wiyusi Shule, uh, Uhura Sasa, um, the nationalist community. They came together from their different strands of political thought uh, to, to, dis to create a coalition that would eventuate into, first it was the concerned leaders and citizens to save our youth, and then eventually the Black United Front. And what I learned from, them, from their example is uh, Al was an elected official, uh, Sam was head of Brooklyn Corps, G2 was a nationalist, pan-Africanist uh, political thought, and my father was the minister. They had very different backgrounds, and they didn't agree on everything, but they agreed on the main thing. And so they came together to create this movement uh, that changed the face of downtown Brooklyn because we entered into a one-year boycott of the, of the downtown Brooklyn community. 
because when Robert Torsley was acquitted, we decided that we couldn't get justice through the court system, so we wanted the, the places that where we spent our money to address the issue. We wanted to have them fund a scholarship fund to create jobs for Brooklyn youth. And we did that by boycotting downtown Brooklyn stores for a year, a year. And in that year, we closed down Martins. That's right. We almost, clo we closed down Corvettes. Then there was Mays, we closed them down. They could not survive the press of the community and the community's demand. So the two remaining stores, a and &S, Y'all remember a and &S, right? I think it's Macy's now, a and &S, and then there was um, May, um, uh, uh, Corvettes, came to the negotiating table and ended up funding the Randolph Evans Scholarship Fund in the name of the young man who was killed on Thanksgiving Eve. We still have that scholarship fund. We still give scholarships every year in the name of Randolph Evans. <laughs> so it was a time for me to learn about coalition building and how you create partnership with people with it, and that you don't have to agree on everything if you can agree on the main objective. And that we each had, they each had their own value to the conversation, they each brought their own set of people. And when we all got there, all we, we, what we knew is that we wanted this particular issue addressed. And so we could park some things at the door in the name of uh, pursuing this one objective. And witnessing that obviously uh, helped to enlighten you how to bring the four of you together to do great things. It's, it helped with my work inside the Democratic Party. Yeah. Because you know we got a lot of different kind of people inside the party. Uh, we the big tent and you know if there's, if there's five people in the room there's 20 opinions. So it, that's the, it helped so me. So it's running that party kind of like being in charge of a church too isn't it? It's kind of similar. Wow. Yes. So you were prepared here. I was prepared. The Lord prepared you. Yes, but I always say that if you can navigate the politics of the black church, the Democratic Party is a snap. Okay, that's great. Um, Minyan Moore, Chicago. Now, it, it goes without saying, I think everybody knows, is well aware of each and every one of these individuals' relationship with Reverend Jesse Jackson and his role in history. But someone that I know many of you know about, but others may not um, know a lot about, uh, was another queen mother who had a great deal of influence on you, the Reverend Willie Barrow, God bless her soul. So tell everybody how she influenced you. Well, I am from Chicago and I grew, I, I grew up, I was raised, born and bred, and each Saturday my cousin would come over to our house and he'd say, who wants to go to Operation Push? And for whatever reason, I was the only one that said, I'll go. And so I started going um, every Saturday, and I would listen to these fiery people speaking about empowerment, speaking about making sure that we spend our dollars in the black community. I didn't really quite know what that meant because I was working for Encyclopedia Britannica. I know the children don't know anything about that because they Google, but there was a book called Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> And so I had, and I was also putting myself through college, and so I wanted, to, we had a paper that we were doing in college. We had, it was a group of us, and it was, when blacks become mainstream, do they lose their identity? And so we went, they wanted us to interview Reverend Jackson. And so we would go over there every week. You know, it was a little multicultural group, so it was looking odd that these little young students and workers would come over every week. But the person we ended up interviewing was Reverend Barrow. And so I, I began to become, you know, because I, I had to do the follow-up interview. So I, I interviewed and I interviewed. And then I started volunteering at PUSH. And then she said to me one day, you need to quit that job you're doing downtown and come work for us. So, you know, I'm working for a corporation. <laughs> and she wants me to come work for a nonprofit. I knew enough to know that they didn't have a package. So I said, how does that work? <laughs> and so she said, you quit one and come work for your people. And so that's actually what I did, but it was the best decision I think I had ever made in my entire life because one, it gave me the foundation of service. It gave me the foundation of giving back. It certainly gave me the moral foundation because she was a clergy, but it also 
I would say it overexposed me to some degree, but it exposed me to leaders that I probably would have never been able to meet had it not been for her and Reverend Jackson. So that was my, my journey. Amen. Um, let me say this at the outset. We are going to take questions, but we're finding that the most efficient way to do that is for people to jot their questions down on the index card. So throughout the course of the evening, if you have a question, just um, hold up your church finger and someone will give you an index card, a, a white card. All right. Is that different from index card? Okay. The white card is for the question. I got you. Okay. All right. I didn't know that. Amen. <laughs> One of the um, ancestors and goddesses that influenced you, Miss Louisiana, um, was Shirley Chisholm. Yes. Talk to us about her role in your life and her influence on you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a great honor to be back here in the House of the Lord Church. <laughs> I mean, I go back to 1980 with Reverend Daughtry, taking that long ride from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I was in college all the way to Brooklyn. We didn't stop for anything but gas. I got here, and you fired up my soul. You put together some things that I didn't know because in the Catholic Church, we don't preach that way. <laughs> Sister Karen Daughtry, for your love and compassion to this community, to members of the Delta Sigma Theta, to Higher Heights and all of those who have sponsored us today, to our publisher, St. Martin Press, Michael and Rebecca, who is here, Veronica Chambers, who helped us with the book. It's a great honor to be here with all of you. Um, I was fortunate as a, a young activist to get a chance to meet a woman who inspired me at a very young age. I grew up at a time when there was both a civil rights movement and a women's movement. And Sherilyn Chisholm embodied the best of both movements. She understood that we had to bring women into the 20th century by proclaiming that she was a feminist, and she understood and stood her ground as a black woman by saying that we needed to have a seat at the table. And Ms. Chisholm said, if they won't give you a seat, bring in a folding chair. And women, we have been bringing in folding chairs, lawn chairs, lazy boy chairs, and any other chair we can find. Ms. Chisholm was dynamic, she was fiery, she wasn't afraid to speak truth to power. When they assigned her to the Agriculture Committee, she said, I don't know why you're doing this, but I'm gonna make sure that I get food and nutrition for every household in America, including here in Brooklyn. She was never baffled by her assignment in life. She understood that she had to open doors and provide for those who didn't have much. So I was honored to work with Shirley Chisholm, to call her a mentor. She seasoned me well, although being from Louisiana, I had the Trinity. But what I was lacking, and grace and humility, Ms. Chisholm provided that. And I want to say once again to Reverend Daughtry, Dr. Daughtry, it is a great honor to be back in this church, to have gotten to know Leah after all of these years, I didn't put the two and two together for a long, long time, but then when I put it together, I say, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> and I am proud of Leah, and congratulations, Leah, and, and, and brother, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you got too much fire left in you. You stoked my fire when I walked in here. And you be careful now, because I'm 58, and I get any more fire in me, I'll be, I be going back out there, and you know what? So thank you. I love y'all. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> now, now, you, um, Yolanda, you and Donna met first around Donna organized the Martin Luther King holiday, I think, right? We did. Yeah. I was working for um, then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski in D.C. In, in her Washington office. And I had this really very, very low-level job. It's called the, they used to call it the robo-operator. So what I did is, we didn't have 
We didn't even have selectrics. I don't think there's some kind of thing that where you would you would I had, I had to answer all the mail, and I create letters that fit different you know different issues. <clears throat> So I been working by myself. I had a little cubicle. I certainly didn't have an office. And somebody came in. I was the only black person in the, in the office, of course. And somebody came in to me and said that there was a young lady out front. Um, and would I mind talking to her? And I said, OK, well, why do they want me to talk to her? <laughs> I'm nobody. So I go out, and we had to stand outside the front door because there really was no room. And I saw Don. I said, oh, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> But well, we were so happy to meet each other and to see somebody that looked like us because there were so few of them back then. And so we've been friends ever since. And you also, in, was that the first time you all met when you interviewed Leah for the job at the DNC, or had you all met before then? We met at the Rainbow. We met, yeah, we met we at, at the Rainbow. Okay, Rainbow. Right. She knew who I was. I wasn't sure who she was. I definitely knew her parents. Um, but uh, I was running site selection for Ron Brown, and I needed to hire somebody. And uh, I think it was Amelia, Amelia. Amelia Parker suggested to Leah, she was, you were working for Ed Towns, mm -hmm. suggested to Leah um, to come over and interview with me, and she put in a good word for her. And Leah came over and interviewed. And you can tell about your interview, but. <laughs> I was so nervous. I was leaving Ed. I had been with Ed Towns for four years on the Hill. It was time to go. And Ron had been elected, and Amelia told me to call Yolanda. I knew Yolanda from the Rainbow. Reverend Jackson had, had his first race. I worked on the 84 campaign. And I, I didn't do 88. I was doing so I can't remember what I was doing. But Yolanda, when Reverend Jackson started Rainbow Push, Yolanda was an executive director. And my dad was running the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. So I would go with him to the meetings, and I would see her. And she was so you know organized. She had a portfolio. She had good suits, nice shoes, always a plus. Um, and so I was like, so I knew, uh, I saw her work, so I knew who she was. So when they told me to call her about this job, I was like, oh yeah, Yolanda Carraway. But I never liked to trade on my relationship with my dad, so I did not raise that in the interview with her. I just did the interview, and I wasn't sure I was going to get the job, but Years, years, I mean, years later, in the, when we were writing this book, is when I found out I was going to get the job unless I grew two heads in front of her, but I didn't know that at the time. So. Um, it, it's amazing how these four started out the way they did and would end up being responsible for the election of four presidents. Clinton twice, actually. They elected... Clinton, Gore, because he won. You're right. You're right. Win. That's true. Obama, yeah. and Clinton again, because she won. Yeah. And in, in terms of you and Mignon, I think this is kind of where, you know, the, the colored girls got codified. There was a situation in the Dukakis campaign, right? And you all came together. Um, Mignon, you want to tell us a bit about that and how they tried to, they tried to put you all in a, in, on a lower floor or move your offices, didn't they? And you all wrote a sign up. Tell us, tell us about that, if you would, Mignon. Well, as the story goes, but it actually starts when I first get there. So you have to know the personality of Donna Brazile. So here I, you know, this is my first opportunity to meet with, you know, to work with her. So I call her like a dutiful friend. Hey, DB, I'm in Boston. Where are you? I'm on strike. So I go, strike? How you strike in a campaign? Right. So she was striking because, for good reason, she was striking because the, the campaign refused to give her money for the Congressional Black Caucus weekend, which was a table, and that was symbolic showing how much the campaign actually supported black people. Well, eventually she got her money, and then she came back to work, finally. So I'm like, it great. Was a, it was a principle of the, uh, of, it was a principle. <laughs> See? See, See, it was a principle. Here we go, here we go. I mean, so no, no, it was a principle of the matter. I mean, how are you gonna tell somebody who's supposed to get out the black vote that we don't have money to That's sit right. with black people, to have to break bread with black people, and to give black people some money. You can't get nothing from nothing. Everybody else get money in politics, but when it comes to black people, we don't need no money. We need money, too. 
We so she was on strike. Butt. I was on. I went on strike. <laughs> Mignon helped. That's why I like Mignon. Mignon came and I don't know how they gave, but they gave me my money. <laughs> <laughs> So I knew then she was a came, good sister after that. Wait, then there came another situation, as we say, situation. So they wanted to move all of, I, I think it was all the brown people, all the Black. women, all the gays, all the, everybody that was different to a different floor. So we, me and Donna were like, but well, that's because y'all were the field staff, right? It wasn't that, well, it was just... No, it wasn't. I no, was Donna political. was political. She was deputy I was political, political director. And I was, was deputy field. field. Right, we were deputy. And Susan Rice was... Well, deputy, she, got to, she got to stay, though. She was right? deputy public policy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, she, she was Well, anyway, there. the point is they wanted to move us. People that look like us want to go down. So, of course, you know, they like cocktails. Sorry, Reverend. They like cocktails in campaign. So about 5 o'clock... I do, too. They went out for cocktails. <laughs> I do, too. I do, three. 5 o'clock. I didn't want no cocktail. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want this she Catholic, so they get to do whatever you know. But this day, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, Reverend, wait, wait a minute, wait. Reverend. What was Jesus' first miracle? <laughs> what was Jesus' first miracle? He turned water into wine, wow. and he got the party started. And listen to his mother. church say amen. amen amen i'm a christian well this particular well, the apostle, day the apostle paul does say take a little wine for your stomach sake <laughs> this particular day donna did do cocktails donna did policy passion and commitment this day so when when the when the when our white counterparts decided to go out for cocktails we scounged around that floor that they was getting ready to put us off of. Whose office did we take? We took somebody's big. We t so we, we moved us in a table as long as this church, and we put a big sign up on the door saying, Color girls, we shall not be moved. And we did not move. And that's how we got started. Paul Brontus, he was the chair of the campaign, and we took over his office, and he didn't know. And Susan Rice, who wore cutoffs and flip-flops, had to join us. She was black. <laughs> but you know, the interesting thing about that move, people that are locked out or feel like they are not included, they started flocking to that office. Soon we had white guys coming there, because some of the higher-up white guys wasn't talking to the low low down white guys. So we had all kinds of people coming in that office. So it became the office of everybody. You know, I, I, I want to ask you something, um, Donna, because you, of course you talk about both Jackson campaigns in the book. Um, this is once again, another moment for women, talking about a women's wave in November. It, isn't it true also, because we talk about Reverend Jackson's campaign in the context of what it did for black elected officials and what have you. But that campaign also as well, did it not uh, influence Mondale's choice as, for a woman no on question. the ticket for the first time? 1984, Geraldine Ferraro. The selection of Geraldine Ferraro had a lot to do with the fact that uh, women felt that, you know, Walter Mondale, Gary Hart, uh, Jesse Jackson, Women wanted a, a seat at the table. They wanted a place. He interviewed several women, uh, including uh, Diane Feinstein, Lindsey Bogg, Pat Schroeder. He settled on Geraldine Ferraro. But that also triggered a conversation among black women because he did not consider one black woman uh, for vice president. Didn't even call anybody and say, well, what? I mean, Pat Harris was a former cabinet secretary. There were more than enough qualified black women who could have been considered, and Shirley Chisholm. And uh, that was uh, the impetus behind uh, starting the National Political Congress of Black Women, in which Shirley Chisholm founded at Spelman College in 1985. Okay, so that, that was an influence. Uh, another influence of you all's work, Yolanda, is, and I know some people may be trying to change it again, but at the time, it was win and take all in terms yeah. of delegates. Mm -hmm. And if that had not changed, mm -hmm. then a Barack Obama right. would not have won the nomination. And really, a Hillary Clinton wouldn't have been able to do as well as she did. Along Hello. So that speak. Exactly. Well, truth. Speak. Truth. No, that is the truth. We, and, we, and we learned, 
One of the things that we learned through that campaign is winning comes in many different forms. We won, we won a lot of states. We were at point one time where we thought we really might win the election, but it was, we, we, we got concessions from the DNC. We got to add 25 members, at large members to the DNC. We got to change the rules of the party, which opened it up for everyone. And they got to see, and the world got to see black people in a way that they had never seen us before. And that was winning. And that did, that did make I a think difference. When the, when the history books are really written about Reverend Jackson, if they tell the truth, it will really talk about the impact that he has had on the American political landscape in ways that people don't even consider. Right. The numbers of people he registered to vote, uh -huh. the number of states he won, the number of, uh, of black elected officials who got elected into office on the coattails of what he did in 1984, 1980. We had David, uh, there were black people who were mayors of every major city across this That's nation right. on, the, on the backs, on the coattails of the people that he registered. He changed the party rules. One of the things he always taught us is you gotta know the rules in order to break the rules. Yeah, yeah. And so three of us are on the DNC Rules Committee. And one, one of the key rules that he changed in terms of how the president, and you know, we can go chapter and verse for hours on party's rules. But one of the key things he changed was that we got rid of winner take all. It used to be before Reverend Jackson ran, you could run for president and have 48% of the vote and get no delegates because we had a winner take all system. Because of his campaign, he forced the party to get rid of that and go to proportional representation, which gives candidates like Barack Obama a shot, gives them a runway into the nomination. And those sorts of things, he, it, he changed the super delegate system, which is why we were so angry about what the party did in terms of reducing the influence of super delegates, uh, automatic does whatever you want to call them. It, it was peeling back layers of hard fought victories that came out of the campaign, the 84 and the 88. Who, who's campaign. peeling back those layers? The, 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 uh, the Democratic Party. Change the rules. But I mean, who in? Because I'm looking at four black women and what you all were able to do to change those rules and make it fair for everybody. So now who? But what you know, do the people look like that are trying to peel back those rules? But Mark, before you go there, he didn't just work inside the party and politics. Reverend Jackson had a black CFO. He had black pilots. Yeah, right. Our dear friend, her father, Lynn, was, her father was one of his lead secret service, but that's after or before he had worked for Nixon and Reagan and Agnew. So Reverend Jackson also ushered in for our eyeballs a level of professionalism, something that we can see ourselves, not just in politics, we could see ourselves in corporate America through his campaigns as well. And I think that's the other legacy that will be written. You know, so I'm, Mark, I'm, I'm asking though, you, I'm who ready. are you. the people? And the reason I'm asking is this. I'm ready. But the reason I'm asking this, and I was saying this to Leah on the phone this morning. Uh -oh. um, I talked with James Clyburn and we did the Negro League analogy because some of these black superdelegates have just, just got in their positions. Mm -hmm. And you got another group of people saying, well, they too old should be gone. Mm -hmm. And we talk, both talked about, Reverend Daughtry, how when the doors were locked to brothers who wanted to play baseball, mm -hmm. they couldn't go to the major leagues so they was in their tw late 20s and early 30s. Satchel Page was in his 50s, maybe 60s. Nobody knows how really old he was. And so Clyburn said, he couldn't run for Congress in South Carolina until he was in his 50s. So it's unfair for some folk coming along younger to say you too old when the doors were locked to us before we even had a chance. So that's why I'm saying who are those who are trying to reverse all of this? There's no question that the Sanders campaign- What do they look like? that the Sanders campaign wanted to dilute the influence of superdelegates, although superdelegates did not determine the outcome of the 2016. But it wasn't just Bernie Sanders. There are others who believe that we no longer need 
uh, uh, at the table, elected officials, party leaders, party activists. And as I told them, they're not going to take away my power. I have earned it. I've earned my seat. I'm not leaving the table. And if I leave the table, I'm going to have a coaster there because I'm coming back. And so it is clear to me, what worries me, Mark, more than anything, is that for those of you who don't know anything about the DNC rules, that Reverend Jackson ushered in proportional representation. Leah mentioned the uh, elimination of winner take all. Proportional representation means that if 48% of your vote come from black people, 48% of your delegates should be black. And as I was, at one point, I was co-chair of the rules committee, and I had a state come up to me and they said, well, they're Arizona. And they said they didn't have any Native Americans. I said, well, you go back and find them because you ain't going to get no delegates unless you put some Native Americans. So we have not just fought for black people at the table. We fought for women. We fought for gays. We fought for Hispanics. We fought for Muslims. We fought for young people. We, when we got to the table, we never had the luxury of being exclusionary. We opened the door and we see everybody come in. We're going to get our power back because we ain't finished. <laughs> Oh, ain't nothing like a fight. And and nothing like a age, fight. For me, it's the age-old question. At the point now where the party is, uh, and, and, and people of color and women and folks from the LGBT community are running and winning these delegacies and uh, have, have reached levels of leadership that make them automatic delegates. So that now you're looking at a 2020 convention if the old rules were in place, where half of the superdelegates would be people of color. Now we want to change the rules. That's great. And, and give you the numbers, but one third of the women who are nominees for the Democrats in terms of the House of Representatives are women of color. One third. Yeah. Yeah. And you tell me that all of a sudden that we're going to have this much power, you're going to take away my power? Oh, hell no. Can I say hell no? Oh, hell no. Got it right. hell, hell is in the Bible. Get it's permission. In the Bible. Okay, Reverend. All right, Reverend. I'll go back to my Catholic church tomorrow. <clears throat> Oh, hell no. I want my power back. I want my chair back. Well, and not only that, and let's, let's deal with the other thing that I notice on everybody's mind. We don't have to dwell on it, but I think we should acknowledge it. I never saw all the networks go live when either one of you black women was sitting in the Oval Office. Okay, now. now, the brother goes in there talking crazy, and that gets... And let me be clear, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm the first one to call out of time. Y'all know that. I, I, I'm a little, you know, I've tempered it a little bit with him because I think I'm worried. I think there's something really wrong there. And I think we need to pray for him. Amen. When somebody goes in there and says, this hat and looking at you makes me feel like you my father, there needs to be an intervention. I'm very worried because um, you don't know where that's going to lead. But what, what do you all think? about that, as much as you've done, as far as we've come, it's like that thing Thursday. I mean, it, in many ways, it set us back, especially for those who don't have the foundation of history that you all have and obviously other people do in this room. Any of you want to comment on Kanye? I, I don't really want to comment on Kanye because I think since Kanye's mother's, mother died, I think right. he's been on a downward spiral since then. And then he got caught up with those women and you know, God knows what's going on over there. So I th I'm just like you, I think the brother really needs help. But, but he, Trump, is exploiting that. He's the, he's, he's the real enemy. Kanye's still a victim because Trump is the one exploiting it, right, Mignon? There is a, a character deficit in that young man. That, that has nothing to do with his mother because his mother gave him all the tools to work with. Because if he was a good man when she was alive, then he should have been a good man after she was gone. The fact is, this boy is, he, now he might have a few issues going on. And, and I'll just go back to Diddy's comment. That was not black excellence at all. And for us to embrace it, I'm glad people spoke out about it, because it, it was just not. And I don't know what possessions is going on in him, but to get up in there, it just looks rather buffoonery to me. It just, it was, it, it, I mean, you know, Reverend Jackson used to have this saying, your dignity level has to match your insult level. I think they just collided up in the White House yesterday. He didn't have neither one, dignity or insult level. I, I, I was one of those 
black pundits, commentators that said something. I, I, really? <laughs> you had a comment? There's, there's one line in me that I, there's a line I draw, and I, it's called Never Again. We're not going back to slavery. And when Kanye began to say that the abolishment of the 13th Amendment was wrongly decided, and then he went so far as to say that black people are dependent on welfare, and then he started using all of those old stereotypes that we have worked so hard to remove from us. I said, he, has, he is trying to set us back 155 years. I recognize that he may have a bipolar condition. And I'm very sympathetic because I have members of my family. But when you see someone making the kind of errors in judgment, you reach out and you say, can I help you? And I think people, I don't know if you heard that when he left the White House, he went over to an Apple store in Georgetown, yeah, jumped up. on a table, yeah. he had on another hat, and he started preaching a, a whole nother sermon that was irreverent, and it was laced with profanity. And you all know that he used profanity in the Oval Office. It was an insult. And I think we're right to call it out, but we should not allow this to distract us from what, at, what is at stake in 24 days. That's right. We have so much riding on Tuesday, November 6th. And we're not just riding on, you know, putting this party or this party in office, this party out of office. We're riding on our own freedom trail. Because if we don't begin to take control of the courts, if we don't understand what's, in, what's at stake in this election, then we're not going to be ready for 2020, 2022, and beyond. This is our moment. We have to seize it. And why you? Because there's no one better. And why now? Because tomorrow's not soon enough. There's too much at stake. Stacey Abrams down there registering voters by the tons, by the millions. And what is the, what is the Secretary of State doing? He's holding back, not processing. If you, look, it's not even that we're struggling to get people out to vote. Now we have to keep fighting for the right to vote as we struggle to get people out to vote. This is our moment, season. And the women in this room, <laughs> you got so much power. Don't you ask nobody if you should vote. You better use your power, because if you don't, somebody's going to abuse it. Kavanaugh's on the court because he got a lucky break from the Russians, from Trump, and everybody else. Don't Dude. let me talk. Um. I'll get in trouble, Mark. Well, come on. I mean, if you want, you, I'm not cutting you off. No, I'm going to turn it over to Leah now. <laughs> Leah? Leah, Leah, do. I mean, I mean we, we fought Kavanaugh. But the fact of the matter is, if it is true that 53% of white women voted for Trump in 2016, Kavanaugh was confirmed in 2016 by those votes. Are white women, do you think, more woke now and following the lead of black women? Because black women stop Roy Moore, black women try to stop Kavanaugh. Are white women gonna do the right thing on their own behalf even? In 20, well, I'm asking now, I'm just asking. I wanna be optimistic, y'all say no? Lord, we ain't gonna make it. Here, here's what I, I, I think the answer to that was evident in the Doug Jones race because when Doug Jones in Alabama, white women still voted for Doug Jones. And black women, but, 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 what did I say? Roy Moore, Roy Moore right. for Roy Moore. Roy, Roy, that's hard to say, Roy Moore. White women still voted for Roy Moore. A pedophile. Banned from the mall. Banned from the mall. And they still went to the polls after the, this is after 2016, and said, yes, I will vote for the pedophile. So it didn't, it didn't signal to me any great shift. Which, and, okay, and I don't, want, I don't want the white women to Twitter, tweet me, talking about it wasn't me, I know it wasn't you. If you was part of the 47, God bless you. Okay, I mean, really, because they will, they'll send you notes. It wasn't me, don't talk about the white women because it wasn't me. I know, I got some good white sisters. 
Love them like family. They are family. But I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about the 53%. I don't believe that there's been any wholesale change because the system works for them. And so because the system is designed to work on behalf of white women, and, and because they are part of the majority, there is no incentive really for them to see the dismantling of the patriarchy. It works for them, why would you? Why would you? So I don't, I think, I think there are pockets. Pockets, I think this Me Too thing in Kavanaugh and places has, has sparked something in some where they realize, them white men ain't paying y'all no mind either. So maybe you ought to reconsider your alignments and come on over, come on over. I mean, we are consistently, black women are the largest and most consistent voting black in the nation. Where's my higher heights, girl? And so we, and we show up. But I, I, I told one of my sisters, one of my, listen, we're not, we not voting to save the nation. We're not here to save you. We're trying to save ourselves. And in the process, the nation gets saved. That's right. But we Always are fighting does. for our lives, for our own communities, for our own children, for our own organizations. We, we know how to pick a candidate, size you up, and decide whether you're worth our vote. And in the process, the nation reaps the benefits right. of what we do as black women. Amen, amen. What, what, what we are seeing in the polls is that millennial women, and especially millennial white women, white women under 30, are breaking. So that's an issue of turnout, because in the last midterm, one out of five voter was a young person. Young people, you are the majority of voters in this country. You outnumber the baby boomers. You outnumber the greatest generation. If you, don't, if you vote, you can change history. You put Obama in there twice, yeah. <laughs> not once, twice. You found something in Obama, you, you better find it in yourselves now, because it is up to you to turn out this election cycle. Amen. Before, I'm gonna take some of the questions. Everybody turn in cards, who has a question? If not, be sure you turn it in. Um, before I get, and we got a couple more coming, that's good. Before I go to the cards though, uh, and there's some really great tidbits in the book. We don't have time to get into all now. You all definitely wanna read about when they uh, had dinner with Barack Obama the first time. And there's something that I didn't even know about that happened when the sister soldier incident went down with Bill Clinton. And there's a little morsel in there, a nugget in there that you might be surprised to read. So I encourage you to check, that's a little tease. I want people to read the book. I'm not gonna tell what happened. <laughs> but I will say this, um, you all are sisters and friends, but there was a little bit of estrangement after your book came out. Yeah. Um, and there's still, um, you know, I said to a few people that I was coming over here tonight and that you would be here and they still, I'm still mad. So. <laughs> Is why are you going over there? I, so no, I'm, I'm I'm good. But where has everything healed now? Um, in terms, and I guess I'm really asking the three of you. You know. Can I talk? To you? You've been talking. <laughs> I'm always talking when I come to church. I'm because this to is get family. This is family. I just want to make sure we all we all good. I I think that what I just personally think what you wrote was you know, while it ruffles some feathers, it, it was useful information that we all can still learn from. And I mean, that's just me, but others of you, I mean, what do you all think about that? Well, Are we good? Yeah. Well, let me just say, you know, cause I think Donna and I, we have a probably a very different relationship than probably all three of us. And we have been in the foxhole together on many different occasions. And so she pro this is probably the first time she will hear this. I think it probably wounded me a lot more than maybe even Tina, I mean, well, Tina, who's not here, and Yolanda and Leah, because we are so close. And she knows I'm her guardrail. And at that moment, I felt like she did not have a guardrail. So that probably hurt me more too, because she was in she was in a, in her own set of pain. We were certainly all trying to heal from an election that just devastated many, including all of us who had worked for Hillary Clinton. And I think what I think what surprised Donna most after the book came out, and people don't know this, when you put Hillary Clinton's name in your mouth especially if it's connected to a negative sentence, 
then that becomes the book. That becomes the article. And while her, her book was probably about a lot more than that, that preceded everything. And, it, and unfortunately, we thought it was a different book. And Donna knows, she knows this. And, but you know what? We are not the housewives. So people shouldn't expect us to be brawling out in the street and cursing at each other. That's not what we do. We love each other. We duke it out. We, you know, we come over. We let them cook for us when they mess up. And we bring juice. <laughs> but, you know, in the end, we thought it was very important not to just say we got this great relationship and we never have problems. And that was one of those moments where we, you know, we really had to work at it. All right. And I would just say, look, Donna is a prolific writer. Yeah. She writes about everything in the old fashioned way on notebooks, yeah. on paper, with a pen. And that's part of how she processes. And, 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 I, and I wish I had the discipline that she has to do it. She likes to write. That's how she maneuvers. And so she wrote her book. And all of us will defend her right yeah. to write a book write a speech, write a column, whatever she wants. That's her right. And she ought to do that as long as she wants. And we always defended that. We just disagree with some of the content um, and had alternate opinions or, you know, as, as folk, grown folk do. But as Mignon said, we thought it was really important that, you know, we, we can't put out a book about friendship and act like we don't disagree from time to time. And not just about this, you know, from time to time we have disagreement about other things, you know, we cut you off the email chair. Yeah. Email chain. You just get lost. You know, you just, you know, you just get dropped from the from the message chain. You get ghost, ghosted. It's called ghosting. You get, oh, is that a ghosted? We just you ghost ghosted. you till you know, till we feel like talking to you again, and we add you back. <laughs> uh, I, I, I asked I asked Yolanda if she had anything to say because I I, I just want to I have two words or three maybe four. <laughs> Go ahead, take ten, take ten. <laughs> I was in a lot of pain. I have, I have spent my entire life in politics. I've given up everything to help people. And when I became chair of the party, had someone given me a little notepad and said, Donna, don't give up this one, because you ain't going to ever recover. I, when I got that call, to be chair of the Democratic Party for the second time in my life, I said, I have to do it because I love Barack Obama and I wanted him to leave the White House with dignity and that's what part of the job of the chair. And I love me some Hillary who introduced me to Obama through her. That's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> Y'all know he didn't just show up out of Illinois without coming through her. I didn't know him at 10th and G, and I remember what kind of cigarettes he was smoking when he met us. Right That's now. how, we, we've, been, we've been around, we've seen some history. But when, when I got into that DNC dealing with my own emotion, you don't know, I lost a child. I've never lost a child in all of the years I've been in politics. When Seth Rich was murdered, it was as if somebody had killed one of my own. He was my child. And I spent the next seven months of my life trying to make sure no child died. This was not just an attack on our country, it was an attack on our individual lives. Putin was trying to make us scared, and he did at times. Being threatened, being told they're gonna even take your dog. And my dog did die. I write about that in the book. I was so raw, I was so emotional, it was my therapy. And I told him on more than one occasion that had I had to write it all over again, I would have sat down, thought, got therapy, instead of writing it. But I wrote it out from the heart. I wrote it in seven weeks. I had to tell that story. And I stand by it. But I still love him. And guess what? They'll come in my house tomorrow, change my furniture. <laughs> Tell me my clothes don't match. Tell me, get the purple out my hair. <laughs> they'll, they'll tell me some things that only my blood sisters will tell me, but they are like blood sisters. 
They are my sisters, and I love them. All right. So we've got a few questions from the audience. We'll see how many we can get to. Um, whoever would like to take this one. What do you think of the Me Too movement? It was founded by a black woman, but white women seem to have taken over. Uh, you know, there's also this discussion um, that white women have suggested that the Take a Knee movement be turned into sexual assault, which, you know, they ought to be a symbol, but I don't know if they should take that movement. Um, also, let me ask you all this in answering that question. Have either of you yourselves had Me Too moments in terms of your journey along politics? I don't know too many women over 50 who have worked and been in the workforce and been professional, in any, and just maybe even housewives that haven't been, you know, from the time that they're children. Yes. You have. Oh, I, as a little girl. And you, I, I, I want to say to Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, I could never tell my story. I was there when Eleanor Holmes Norton, Anita Lloyd, Jolene Ansel, Patsy Mink, Barbara Boxer decided to march across the tarmac to make sure Anita Hill got a hearing. I was the advanced person. I tell you, I'm old. Reverend Daughtry, I've been walking all my life. And I, I, I didn't feel nothing. I said I had to do my job. But when Christine Ford, oh, it flooded. I had to call my oldest sister and say, Cheryl, remember? We, we started talking. I called my friends. It came back. So yeah, this Me Too thing is real. Because sexual assault, like sexual violence, is underreported in our society. People don't want to talk about things. They don't want it out there. And it's a very, it's a taboo subject, but it's out there now. And it's gonna keep coming out. Either one of, either one of you wanna share? I, I'm, I'm grateful. I've never had that experience. I am so grateful. No, I haven't either, not in the workplace. Okay. Um, is Kamala Harris the black woman we've been waiting for? I assume the person who asked that question is thinking about the, the White House, right? Let me say this, and, and as you all ponder how you want to answer that, uh, one of my regular guests is Marcos Melitsis of Daily Coast, and we were on there the other day, and Marcos, so we were two men on the radio, and we both agreed to this, that in 2020, there is no need for a man to be on a ticket. That if a man is on a ticket in 2020, it is still um, an example of compromise. That that's, that's what he said is just not necessary. But this person is asking about Kamala. I think I know Kamala. I've known her since she was in college, and I think she's an amazing person. We're all so proud of her. Um, but I was thinking yesterday, and I don't know if any of you all have thought through this, but this, this 2020 election is going to be the most diverse election that we have ever seen in our lives. There are going to be four, probably, African Americans, yeah. two Hispanics, yeah. maybe five women. Well, in Kamala counts, she gets a two for. <laughs> she's three, because she's Indian American. That's right, also. that's right. She's, she's a Indian, three too. Right, yeah. okay. And then you got a whole bunch of old white men that, <laughs> that are going to be in there. All these but goodies. And then you've got some that are okay, you know, senators and governors. And then you got some young blood. Like, you know, if Beto doesn't win in Texas, maybe he'll run for president. I hope he comes and runs the DNC, but <laughs> we'll see what happens. But, you know, it's going to be so, it's going to, this is going to be something we have never, ever seen before. It's, it's going to be historic. Speaking of that, um, another um, person acknowledges the record number of women running for office. You all did mention Stacey Abrams and others. Lucy McBath, Jordan Davis's mother, again, a case of police violence running the 6th District in Georgia. She needs uh, our help, uh, Ilhan Omar, the Muslim sister in Minnesota. But this person asks, um, how can we as ordinary citizens help to combat uh, voter suppression, redistricting, and other forms of disenfranchisement of American citizens? We have to win elections, uh, especially 
Secretary of State's elections. Right. Because as you all know, there's no constitutional amendment. There's only four amendments in the Constitution that provides a prohibits discrimination based on race, sex, gender, and age. Race, gender, age. I'm sorry, I said sex and gender. But because of that, we have to control these state houses, period. These are state decisions. And look what's going on in North Dakota. Now, if you have a P.O. box, because you've lived on a reservation all your life, you can't vote, because they say you need a street address. Well, there's no street address on a reservation. And in Indiana, they have purged over 400,000 people. 400,000, mainly in Marion and Lake County. Lake County is Gary, Indiana. Remember the Jackson Five? So this is why we have to win elections. Because, this, because voter suppression, voter intimidation, gerrymandering happens when you don't control state houses. But you also can't wait till election day. And we Check have your seen, status. Yeah, we have seen this playbook before. And for those of you who have family in some of these battleground states, you need to make sure that they are calling their registrars now because they will get to the polling place, they will get there and all of a sudden their names have been removed. We need to take to the airwaves and make sure we, we are on talk radio because we will sleep and then November 6th we'll go rushing out and then all of a sudden 53,000 votes or, or registra registrations will be lost. We've seen it happen. Listen, we saw it happen in 216. Take nothing for granted and use your power right now today when you leave here. And start texting about it, start writing about it because I think you have to raise awareness around it. I think the only reason why the Secretary of State in Georgia might not get away with it is because of social media. And they just blasted them. But that's just how important those Secretary of State's offices are. I'm sure we all remember Ms. Harris from Florida. And people don't right. think those right. jobs are important, but they're the most important. Uh, speaking of Florida, I'm going to go to the next question. It's very specific, but uh, it's an in-depth question. The gubernatorial race in Florida with a black man running, our brother Andrew Gillum, shout out to that brother. How will Hurricane Michael's devastation impact the voting on November 6th? Those who lost property may not um, be thinking about voting and may not have proof of address. The suppression may take advantage. What can be done? The good news is that Andrew Gillum is already on top of it. Yeah. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Law filed a lawsuit and not only to ensure that those voter registration records are preserved or to give people opportunity who were not able to have their registration status confirmed before Hurricane Michael, uh, we will uh, have, a, I, I guess, an answer. Uh, they also filed in Georgia with three of the counties impacted by Hurricane Michael. But yes, if anybody who knows anything about the Pensacola, Panama City area, that is a pocket of black folks. Every st southern state has a pocket of black folks, and that is a pocket of black folks. And so they're already on top of it. But let me also say this. They need help, folks. Mm -hmm. FEMA is not going to arrive. Trust me, FEMA's federal employees missing in action. <laughs> Can I, can I borrow that? You are welcome. Can I please borrow that one? Missing in action when it comes to poor that'll neighborhoods. Poor Voucher, people, that'll preach. Poor people, they will not. Be, so please, this church, send resources, send help. We write in our book how when Katrina made landfall and I needed help, these sisters stepped up to the plate to help me. Yes, my sister Ziola still has Mignon's furniture. My sister Lisa still has many of Yolanda's designer's clothes for her children. <laughs> when my daddy was passing through this world, Leah was there. This church has stood by my family, this, these sisters. You stand by the people of Georgia and Florida. And by the way, don't forget the folks in South Carolina yeah. and North Carolina. FEMA is federal employees missing in action. Speaking of... Uh... Amen. I like that. Speaking of clothes and cooking, the book will also reveal uh, Yolanda's uh, nickname, the Black Martha Stewart. So, question. How do you take over the DNC? How can we help? Let me just add to that. Because, and I'm one, full disclosure, was a Democrat, left a party, formed a black political party, came back. 
um, the Umoja Party in D.C. But it, see, it, it I learned, though, I mean, with you all's influence and so many others, the, the Democratic Party could be, kind of was, kind of is, a black party. Because we are the most loyal constituency in the party. We just need to make sure the leadership and policy doesn't take us for granted and reflect that. So numbers-wise, we got it, right? Or, 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 or do we not? So the question is asking, you know, is it ours? If not, how do we take it over? I mean, what, what do we do? You talking about the DNC? Or the, there's the, the operational arms of the party, the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, the Congressional Campaign. Though, you know, those are, the, those are organizational things and they have their rules about who gets elected and how that gets elected. In terms of, in terms of the DNC chair, we're not the majority of the DNC members to elect a chair. You, we have to be in coalition with other people to elect a chair. But there, there are the, the hidden apparatus of the Democratic Party, the donors, who tend to follow the traditional way of doing things, the pollsters, the media buyers, who tend to follow a very old, uh, traditional path in terms of who they're gonna support. In the case of Andrew Gillum, for example, he ran and raised $7.7 .7 million. He did not have the support of the traditional donor players who were raised, and they were giving $37 million to his opponent. And so what you see now is with candidates like Andrew, with Stacey, uh, with Lauren Underwood, with Lucy McBath, with Ayanna Presley in Massachusetts, Johanna Hayes in Connecticut, you're seeing people who are running now and winning the Democratic nomination without the help of the party. But they the, always did. The rent running without the help of the party, and what that indicates to me is a set of people who are saying, I don't need the party. I may have Democratic Party values, but I don't need the institutional structure. It would be nice to have. Yes. Right? Our chair, Tom Perez, endorsed Andrew Cuomo in his primary, but refused to endorse Stacey Abrams in hers. So you have these sort of dichotomies and these sort of tensions, and what you have with this new wave of candidates who are winning without the help of the party is a set of people who are coming to change the party from the outside in. You were convention CEO. That was yes. a title, right? Yes. 2008 and 2016. Yes. And so you will be convention CEO a consecutive time in 2020. No, no. <laughs> Let's pray I'm, now. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's like me. I That's know, enough. What, you, it, it, the signal must have broke up. I, I, I lost the signal. What did you say? No, no. There's a reason nobody ever did it more than once, and I went and did it twice. I'm, I'm, I'm done. You done? They, I'm done. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I, unless Jesus, unless Jesus comes down, speaks to me in both my ears, uh, and, and says that this that I am called to do it a third time. I, that's not, that is not my intent. Okay. Okay. Um, what? Say what? Keep going. Is your name Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> How did each of you handle different layers of bias in the halls of power? Um, <laughs> and is it always reflective of race, class, gender? I guess it, it all overlaps and intersects at different points, doesn't it? I'm going to confess since I'm cap. I have cussed so many people out. I have cussed them out. Which, which belies a chapter in the book, Leah, when you talk about Dorothy Height, the chapter is Real Power Whispers, which is not what you do. But go, go oh, ahead. Oh, I don't do that. I, I, I cuss <laughs> you out. No, these sisters here, especially Mignon, she's a diplomat in the family. And Leah, Leah will pray. She got a soft, soft praying voice. Yolanda will look at you and you know you get, get out of her way, but I will cuss. I will cuss you. I'm trying not to cuss, you, Reverend. Do y'all remember I said the guardrails? That's what I'm talking about. you out. I think people now know, don't even ask the question. I'll cuss you out. I'm so sick and tired of racism and sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism. I'm sick of it. I want to live in a world where I don't have to fight no more. I'm sick of it. 
She gonna find something to fight about. Now, if you all look at page 105, <laughs> how many of y'all have your books? Um, please turn to page 105. When you found the gospel, say amen. <laughs> Second paragraph. We were intelligent and capable. We were also nurturing. So much so that occasionally one or two of us wondered our out loud, it's dark, I can't see, out loud, but only among ourselves, do the men in power think of us as mammies? Are we the C-suite version of the help? Donna offers, well, we're not butlers, that's for sure. I do believe they rely on our faith, they rely on our resilience, they know we don't break easily, and they know that we have been through so many storms. Leah adds, and we're going to outwork anybody. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and the hearers thereof. Question specifically for Donna Brazil. Where does your thinking fall on traditional Democrats versus socialist Democrats? You know, if you call raising the wage socialism, if you call making sure that everybody have health care socialism, I've been listening to Republicans try to define Democrats as being so left of the mainstream that we're uh, going to, I guess, run Venezuela. No, our values are values of inclusion, of empowerment, of ensuring that every American have a healthy start and a head start in life. And while the Republicans want to label us, I don't think we need to be labeled. There are those who believe that the traditional Democrats take too much money from corporate America. I do believe that as Democrats, we should be able to have a balanced portfolio where we are able to take money from the grassroots, but also those who, in, in corporations, there are a lot of nonprofits and corporations that are not antagonistic toward my interests. And I would like to make sure that they can also serve to build up civic responsibility. Hey, Starbucks is going to make sure that people get to the polls. Uh, uh, Lyft is going to make sure people get to the poll. I applaud that kind of, of whatever you want to call it. I don't go with the label. I go with what's in the heart. Black women wrote an open letter to the DNC, which is in the book. You all can read it. Um, what changes, if any, have you seen since that letter was written? Anybody? Yolanda? None. All right. None. Sadly, I agree. None. Well, I say, I, here's what I say. Nothing has changed at the DNC. I think what has changed among the black women who wrote that letter is a, 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 is, a is a, is a, is, what'd you say? I said they're more active. They're more active. We, you know, we, we took our, our grievances to the chair. The chair uh, did not address them in a meaningful way. And so those of us who helped sign that letter, including my high height sisters and uh, some of the electeds, uh, we, we knew we had, we got nothing coming. And so we are more active on our own, again, changing the party from the outside in. Let me just say something about this party that we've all been involved in. I've served as CEO, Leah served as chief of staff, uh, Yolanda's deputy chief of staff and chair. This party is no more than who's in it. And if they don't have right-minded people inside the party, then you can't expect nothing. And the challenge that the party has right now is that it doesn't have enough people that have the courage to challenge things. When we, were, when we had a seat at the table, I helped elect Terry McCullough. When Leah and them had a problem at the DNC, I had to shed all of my loyalty to Terry. When 10 black folks were targeted, we had to call, and you know, people know when my name show up in the press, then there's a problem. 
So, of course, Donna's name showed up in the press, and then the press called me, and I said, well, if Terry McAuliffe has a 10-person black, a 10-person list that has all black people that's being fired, then that is a problem, and I would be surprised. But we didn't stop there. We marched over to, not little, well, what I, high heels on. We walked over to his office. We had a meeting with him. We got a deputy chair hired as a result of that. The party will only be as good as the people that's in it. You have to push every leader. I've worked for some of the best of them, and I can tell you, can I, Isaiah, every time you want them to do what is right, their back will go up, especially if they know they don't want to do it. You have to push them. And they don't have any qualified, well, they have a lot of qualified people. Uh, for, whatever, for whatever that streaming thing is going on. They have a lot of qualified people, but they don't have a lot of people with courage. They don't have a lot of people that's willing to stake their jobs on the fact that stuff is not right. And that's what's wrong with the party. And I think I the other part, of it, okay. other part of it is that, you know, I was raised to believe in an inside-outside strategy. And so part of that whole thing, episode, which we call the Troubles, yeah. Uh, when, the, when the staff was targeted. We were the inside strategy, but we had an outside strategy. Right. And part, part of my longevity in the party, besides I'm just good at what I do, is during that time, I was, I was I'm going to make tell you the story, I was in the supermarket, I was in the Safeway buying groceries, minding yes. my business. And we call. And they call. Where are you? I said, I'm buying groceries. It's a Saturday, what you talking about? They said, have you talked to your father today? I said, well, no. I didn't talk to him today. What, is he all right? Why, what, what's the matter? They said, you better call him. I said, well, what, what's he doing? He bringing the buses. <laughs> and not only was he bringing the buses, he had a message. Choose your weapon. I will never forget it. That was his message to Chairman McCullough. Choose your weapon with he the was, buses. He was going to ring that DNC with a bunch of activists <laughs> like the DNC had never seen before. <laughs> and they was not trying to really have that. I had to call him and say, Daddy, <laughs> what you doing? What you doing? He said, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm just making my phone calls. Who you calling? <laughs> he said, uh, you talk to Mignon? I said, yes. He said, well, I just hung up with Maxine. I talked to Charlie Wrangle. I talked to uh, Cleaver. I was on the phone with Clyburn. And I'm about to call, and I was like, oh my goodness. I said, well, I'm not ready to be fired yet from the inside. I said, okay, are you really bringing buses? Well, I just hung up with the bus company. I remember that. I remember that. I remember that. Tear so, up. so there was gonna be, so you had the outside. Choose your weapon. Don't play. So, I, and I knew between my, my nationalist, pan Africanist roots people <laughs> and my church people, it was going to be a problem. That's right. It was going to be a problem. And so, you know, they were like, well, Terry, you about to have some buses. Let's get and it you on. About to, and then you got the CBC man. And then they, so when, by the time they said, Terry, we would like to meet, he's like, I'll meet. Yeah, see, and and, and just, God bless him, he was a good man, so he yeah. was an unaware of the problem and he probably moved to fix it. But see, we didn't just meet. We actually strategized on the meeting. Before the meeting. Before the meeting. Even to the point that we all decided we were wearing black. And we also decided that we weren't going to tell Alexis Herman, who is one of our mentors, because she's the softy. So we had to leave her out the strategy until the end. But you have to talk, when you, when you think you're getting ready to take on somebody, you gotta know what you're doing. Tina was the lawyer. We knew that she would be calm. We knew that she would be measured. She knew, we knew that Regina would come in, in with an orange pantsuit on after we said we were wearing black. <laughs> I mean, seriously, people. I mean, but anyway, the point and is- And because we I was the beleaguered chief of staff, I was not in the meeting. Yeah, I was, was in the one my that office. got clapped at when we came off the elevator. We were like, oh, we're so sorry. We're I, I was, here I was beleaguered and I was upset. And oh my goodness, how could this possibly happen? And Terry, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And they were like, oh, don't worry. Mm -hmm. I knew everything they were doing because but, we had all strategized. Yeah. But uh -huh. when, when, here's the moral when they're targeting 
the least of these. Yep. Yep. The people who are at the bottom rung of the payroll That's for dismissal right. because they want to save money in order for a presidential candidate who is a multi-millionaire. Mm -hmm. It was the moral of what was happening, and we refused to be silent. I mean, that was a moment. And I'll never forget, we went out and had dinner later, and Senator By Byron Dorgan walked up and said, how did this get leaked? Who did that? Who told the press? And I sat there, looked at him, and I said, I guess it was me. <laughs> He ain't spoke to me since, <laughs> and I don't miss him. These, amen, these four ladies and gentlemen have influenced every moment of not just black history, but American history for these decades that they've been working from the time they were very young. Um, and we're great, first of all, I'm, I'm honored and humbled to even be considered worthy to be here among you. But you all have had a great influence on my life. I wouldn't be able to do anything without them. And nothing jumps off without them. Whenever we organize in something, um, they get involved in it. People call me and say, Mark, we want you to help organize something. And Leah knows as soon as I hang up the phone and say, I'll do it. I call Leah, say, come on, we're going to do this together. But um, I'm thankful for them as we all should be. Lastly, just let me say here in this house where many African leaders have come. It was Dr. Osajigo Kwame Nkrumah who said, the degree of a nation's revolutionary awareness may be determined by the political maturity of its women. Well. Not its men, but its women. And these four reflect the political maturity of our people, these four queens, and hopefully the political maturity of each and every one of us who follows them, all right? Uh, just before we break, I wanna, because he's here, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna tell y'all a, a short story about how we even got to a book. Um, because it's important that you understand. We, you know, we just do the work, right? So we weren't trying to have our names and lights or anything. And our, our sister, uh, there's a set of West Coast color girls and one of them, Felicia Henderson, who's the producer of Soul Food. Um, Y'all remember Soul Food? Soul Food. She came, she came east and we were having dinner and she said, you know, you, you, people need to know your story. Yeah. So you should, we should invest in a series on you. And she's a writer, so, you know, we, we said no. We said no about five times, no, not interested, no, no, no. And she finally wore us down and got us, some, uh, and then got us connected with with, with Madam Winfrey. Mm -hmm. That she, would be Oprah. She of the one name. <laughs> and, and we went to HBO. She got us a meeting at HBO. We went to HBO and we sat there and, and you know, talked to each other for an hour. <laughs> and while they watched uh, us talk to each other, and when it was over, they said, okay, we want to sign you. We want to do a series. And we said, okay, that's great. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh huh. Lovely. And then we went in the hall and said, what does that mean? <laughs> we're like, Do we, we came out for the free flight and the free hotel. And, and a nice we ain't come out for a series. Like, is, this, is this normal? So they said, you just got a contract with HBO. We were like, oh, okay, okay. So we finally get the script back two and a half years later. And we reading the script and like, it was called The Color Girls and we said, is this us? Because it didn't, it didn't, it didn't seem like us, and they kept saying, "Well, no, you know, you're, this is HBO. It has to be fictionalized. We're gonna fictionalize." It's in your, your likeness. Character. It's in your likeness. It's fictionalized. I said, "But, but my character is a single, Pentecostal pastor, who is the chief of staff of the Democratic National Committee." My character was dating a white reporter from the New York Times. That's very off, people, you should know that. And he was giving me all kinds of secrets that I supposedly was giving to the White House. And by the way, I work for the White House. I'm like, uh-oh, can't do that. It was nuts. And I was like, yeah, you, you can't. Well, oh, it's, it's fictional. As I said, no, no, because the stuff y'all have me doing in this treatment would get me put out of church. <laughs> 
really trying to make it like scandal. It, it was it was just it was crazy, and we we went back and forth with each other because we already didn't want to do it to begin with. So we were so we wanted to make sure we were looking at it with a pure lens. So we gave it to our brother Isaiah Thomas for him to read. And he read it and said, y'all can't do this. <laughs> just know, just know the answer is no, you can't do this. Do you, do you understand what you have achieved in the American political scene? You cannot allow your narrative and your story <laughs> to be diminished like that. And since he's here, since he's here, did y'all see Isaiah? Since he's here, I want to thank him in public for making sure that the work of fiction never saw the light of day. And he's the one that really got us on this path to writing this book. We love you, we love you, we love you. And Lynn is here, we love Lynn. And Zeke, the son is like the best DJ ever. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. So we're glad to see you and we want to be sure in this form to thank you publicly for all that you have meant in our lives. So there are two brothers that we have to thank. The other one is Mark. Yes. We did a radio right. interview. And you'll see both of these brothers reflected in the book because we felt that it was so important that we acknowledge them. But Mark, we did a radio interview and we go over and he gave us these fancy badges. And they had our pictures on them and the title on the badge was the title of the book. We didn't know it at the time, but it was, we, we adopted that title, and that's how we got the title of the book. It was Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Isaiah. Uh, we actually have one more question from the shepherd. Oh, no, the mother. I thought it was from, okay, forgive me. I'm sorry, mother. Um, you want to ask it yourself? Okay, you want me to ask it for you? Power Rising. How did that come to be? Yes. Power Rising actually uh, was an idea that I had um, after the election. Mignon and I were invited to speak at the retreat of the Congressional Black Caucus Women. And at the end of the retreat, um, Mother Maxine said, so Leah, Leah, what should we do now? What do you think we should do now? I mean, I don't, what, what's your suggestion? I, and I said, and Mignon told me I should never use this phrase ever again. If I could wave my magic wand, I would call a convention of, of a summit of black women for us to come together and determine our own political future and how we want to move as a collective. We have established uh, our credentials, particularly through this last election. So how do we move as a unit? And that's how Power Rising really started. Over time it morphed and it became, as we looked at the other sisters who were making power plays in, in corporate America, in technology, we decided to broaden it beyond politics and so Power Rising became a gathering place by, for, and about black women. And I, we focused on business and the economy, culture and community, education and innovation, health and wellness and political empowerment. We had our first gathering in February in Atlanta. Uh, a thousand black women from 40 states came together to map a path for us. We're meeting again, sisters, February 2019 in New Orleans, yeah. where we have Latoya Cantrell as the mayor. Uh, and so we are, we, the planning has begun in earnest and we hope to see you there uh, as, we begin, as we continue to this conversation about how we move black women forward. I drove them all crazy, but they stood behind me and helped us make this a reality. And when it was all over, Mignon handed me a beautifully wrapped box and inside the box was a magic wand. <laughs> she said, whenever you feel the need, to say those words again, can it, and look at the wand instead. Um, that was it, but I cannot resist this last question. I don't know who gave me this. Th this is your question? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Why don't one of you run for president? Oh, oh, woo, huh? Well, everybody know I run my mouth too much. <laughs> I 
have never desired public office. I've always wanted to be the, but I'm, I'm very much an introvert. And I like being behind the scenes and making things happen. So I just never even thought about running for policy, running for anything. I'm good. <laughs> I'm woke, but I ain't that woke. <laughs> I would love to run a defense department, though. <laughs> Woo! Donna, you should run FEMA. I would love to run a defense department. <laughs> you need to run FEMA. Ain't no, don't study war no more. Here I come. Folks, um, this is streaming on For Colored Girls on Facebook. Uh, this the will Colored air. Girls the Colored Girls, I'm sorry. The Colored Girls on Facebook. Uh, follow them uh, on Twitter at The Colored Girls One, the number one. Um, this will also be posted later on Make It Plain, and it will air on Sirius XM next week uh, on the radio. And uh, lastly, uh, book signing will be downstairs. And for those of you who don't have books yet or want to buy some more books, probably want to buy more than one now to share with family members, you can do so downstairs. And we, first of all, let's do this. Let's thank the four of them. Mignon Moore, Leah Daughtry, Yolanda Carraway, Donna Brazil, for colored girls who have considered politics